All right, in section 6.2, we are going to do addition and subtraction of rational numbers. We're going to start with the most basic, which is addition, and the most basic of that, which is addition when you have like denominators. So if you have two rational numbers, A over B, C over B, rational numbers, B is the same. The denominators are the same. Then in order to add fractions that have the same denominator, what do you do? The denominator stays the same, and what do you do on top? You add the numerators together. It's that simple. Um, it's a good idea for us to talk about why that works. So I'm going to draw a picture. We're going to do an example, and we're going to do the example of, let's say, 1 fourth um, plus 2 fourths. I just want the denominators the same, so I, I recognize that 2 over 4 is not simplified, but that's not my concern at this moment, okay? So we're going to draw a picture. I'm going to draw a picture. It's a circle, although rectangles or squares, any of that would work just fine. What I want to do is I want to shade in, in this diagram, one fourth. So I draw the picture into fourths. We did this in the last section. And one fourth is one of these four slices, right? And then two fourths would be two of these four slices. So the answer ends up being three of the four slices. The biggest concern for students when they see addition and subtraction is they totally get the add the numerators together bit, but they really struggle sometimes with why they don't add the denominators together. Picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, this really shows, well, I still only have four pieces, right? There's still only four to start with. There's four locations or four spaces or whatever it is you're doing. Um, you can do this with money. You don't have to do it with, you know, diagrams and shading. You could talk about having one quarter of a dollar and one half of a dollar, and how much does that give me? Well, it gives me 75 cents, three quarters of a dollar. You could do that. If you have unlike denominators, things get messier very quickly. All right, so there are a lot of ways you could talk about doing this. We've encountered a couple of them in the last section. You could get least common denominators, which is great if you have the ability to do them. It saves you a little work in the end. Or you can get common denominators, which we encountered in the last section as well. This definition is built around the idea of common denominators. And the reason that they use this one, I believe, is because it's so nice visually. And so let me show you what I mean by that. What they actually have you do is they have you do that same sort of a cross multiplication for when we're comparing things, A times D, B times C. Okay, so we're already sort of in the mindset of being able to do that when we compare. And then they multiply the denominators together. So you end up with something that looks a little bit like a smiley face. The visual helps students to remember. So this is the one that they show us. It's not the only way to do it. If you choose to do it a different way, that's fine. But this is a really good visual. Okay, so this is unlike denominators. You might ask yourself, well, would it work on like denominators if I forgot that I could just add across the top? You know, would a student get messed up? And the answer is yes, it will work just fine with like denominators, no problem. You'll end up with more reducing in the end, but it'll still work, okay? All right, so we're going to do an example. We have 1 over 3 and 5 over 3. Pretty straightforward. What are we going to do? We're going to add the numerator. So we have 1 plus 5 over 3, which gives me 6 over 3. And we're going to reduce in the end. And so what does that end up giving me? 2. So that's like denominators. Here's my unlike denominator. So I'm going to continue the way that I had mentioned it before because you may not be as familiar with that option. I'm going to cross multiply. So I have 1 times 3 is 3 plus 4 times 5 is 20 over 4 times 3, which is 12. What is 3 plus 20? 23 over 12. And unless I'm told to, I don't need to turn that into a mixed number. It's fine, just like it is. Reduce it if you can. This one doesn't reduce. 23 is prime, so it doesn't reduce. But if you can reduce it, you would. OK, so now we're going to talk about those mixed numbers. Mixed numbers. From a purely mathematical sense, like this is me speaking as a mathematician, mixed numbers are really difficult to work with. Usually, they're just, they're not the most convenient thing because they have one part of it that's whole and one part of it's a fraction. And if I just had one item, I could deal with it. But because I have two different objects that are somehow joined together, it just makes things messy. But 
from a very practical sense, they're in our everyday lives everywhere. And we use them all the time. For instance, you wouldn't say, I ate five halves of a cookie. No, you would say two and a half cookies. That's what you would say. It's the same value, five halves and two and a half, same thing. But you have never in your life said, I ate five halves of a cookie. Right? We don't talk like that. So we use these all the time. So that's why we're going to talk about them in the most practical sense is because of that. All right. So what we're going to do first is we're going to learn how to change something that's improper. Improper just means it's got a bigger value on top than on bottom into a mixed number. So what do you remember that you have to do? Right, so the numerator, it goes underneath the division sign. The denominator goes on the outside. And we're going to divide. How many times will 14 go into 3? I said that wrong. How many times will 3 go into 14? <laughs> 4, yes. What is 4 times 3? 12. And when I subtract, I get 2. Now you have to make sure you get the answer you know, out of this um, process in the right way. This is the whole number part. This is now my new numerator. And my denominator is the same as it was before. So this is 4 and 2 thirds. You guys remember that? Okay. We're going to do the same thing with this one in reverse. Right? We're going to give it, we're given a mixed number and we're going to turn it into an improper fraction. Um, we're going to talk about the why this works in a minute too. I can't remember if I had it on a different slide or on this one. I think I usually talk about it on this one. Okay, so let me say first that the negative in the front, it doesn't matter. It's kind of like last time when we were comparing two numbers and they were both negative, we're like, okay, check mark, I know that they're both the same, they're both negative. That part's good to go. Let's compare whatever else we've got to work with. Same kind of thing here. My answer is going to be negative because the original value is negative. So in the midst of working with it, we're going to ignore the negative. I don't need the negative part. You guys with me on that? Okay. So we're just going to be looking at the number 3 and 5 eighths. So I'm going to show you sort of the visual. I'm a really visual person. I can remember things really well when I see them. Um, and so I'm going to show you the visual for this. I'm going to, going to explain why it actually works. So visually, we draw this sort of circle like this, this half circle. We take this 8 and we multiply by 3 and we get 24. And then we add it to the number on top, which gives me 29. That's my new numerator. The denominator stays the same. So you've got this beautiful imagery over here, at least, I don't know about beautiful, but it's at least easier to remember because I see a picture of this sort of half circle. I've got a multiplication symbol, I've got an addition symbol, and I can go with it from there. Okay. Now, of course, I mentioned before we were going to ignore it, but we don't want to ignore it in the final answer. It is negative. So I have negative 29 over 8. So that's sort of those, you know, like the way that I remember it kind of things. But some kid somewhere is going to ask you, but why, Miss Smith? But why? Why does that work? I don't understand. Um, and whether or not it actually helps them to do it correctly next time, answering the why does it work is often helpful for kids too. So let me show you why it works. And it's really not that complicated. But if you have the number 3 and you have the number 5 eighths, this is really 3 plus 5 eighths. And that's what it is, right? You have three whole things and you have 5 eighths of something else. You have three whole pizzas and you have 5 eighths of another pizza. That's what you really have. Okay? So let's go with that pizza imagery just a moment. You can even draw yourself pictures if it helps to do it, especially if you're working with a ch young child where that, they're in that real concrete stage. What does that three mean? Well, if I have the five over eights and I think about a pizza, which works really well because pizzas are often sliced into eight pizzas, pieces, it means I have five pieces in that pizza left, correct? But what about those other three pizzas? How many pieces do I have in one pizza? Eight, right? So what we can actually do in a numerical sense is we can think about this as three holes. That's three over one. Or in a picture sense, we can draw three circles, call them pizzas, and draw one more circle and divide it into pieces so that we have the five-eighths there. And we can get a common denominator. Or we can slice that pizza, the whole pizza, into eight pizzas. And if I had eight pieces per pizza and I had three pizzas, how many pieces would I have? 
24 is right. And now do you see where that 24 came from? 24 is what I got when I multiplied 3 times 8. Right? It is. So this is the 24 over 8. And then why did I add it to the 5? Because I still have 5 of those other slices that I had in the portion of a pizza that I had left. So I end up still with the 29 over the 8. It's not that hard, right? I mean, I don't want to write it out like this every time. Don't get me wrong. But this is the why that it works. Any questions on that one? Okay. Some properties of addition. One of the nice properties of addition says the following. If you have a rational number A over B, then there will always exist the exact opposite number, negative A over B, so that when you add the numbers together, you get back zero. That's actually what makes it the inverse, not the fact that one's positive and one's negative. It's the fact that when you add them together, they give you back zero. Every rational number has this property. It always has an opposite. Now I say that, and there's one number that kind of throws people a little bit when it comes up. It usually comes up when I teach um, number theory. What about the number zero? What is the additive inverse for the number zero? What number would I add to zero to get back Zero. Zero. He's his own additive inverse. That's okay. It's like weird, right? I mean, I get it, but it still works. Definitionally, it still works. So if I have the number zero, it is a rational number because it can be written as zero over one or zero over 553,294, right? I mean, like it's a rational number. Its opposite, its additive inverse is itself. So every number has this property, rational number. Another property of addition is the additive property of equality. If you have A over B and C over D and they're rational numbers and they're equal, then anytime you have another rational number like E over F and you add it to each of the numbers you already had, the number stays equal. And it looks really weird and it looks really funny, but you've used it probably 10,000 times. You've used it so much. So, Let's just do it with numbers so that you can see that it works. A over B and C over D are supposed to be the same number, so let's say that one of them is one-third and one of them is two-sixths. We used that number just a little while ago. One-third and two-sixths. Well, this means that if I add, we'll just go with another uh, one-half to each one of these numbers, it's still going to be equal. Right? That's what happens. Um, if you think about it in terms of a physical object, physical objects are helpful to think about too. Okay, remind your name. Okay, come up in here and join me. Okay, I'm not sure if we're the same height, but we're whatever we are. <laughs> so if I took off my heels, all right, whatever we are. Okay, so well, we're standing up here, and if we both then took up a step on a stair, you know, stepped up here, right, we both added the same amount to our height, the difference would be the same. It'd be exactly like it was before. It wouldn't change anything. That's all this is doing. It's adding the same amount. It's adding the same lift to whatever we had before. Thank you so much. Okay. And you've used it in solving equations, so we're going to use it to solve an equation. That's what we're going to do with it, okay? So we have x minus 2 and a half, and it equals 3 and 1 third. Well, we need to get x alone, right? Remember a little bit from algebra, the goal is to have x all by itself. So what are we going to have to do to get x all by itself? Okay, we're going to have to add the 2 and the 1 half. We'll figure out the denominator situation in a minute. But we're going to have to add the 2 and 1 half to both sides, right? What property allows me to add the 2 and the 1 half to both sides. I don't remember what it's called, but it's a property where it's like whatever you do to one side, you have to do it to the other side. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember what the scientific name for it is. Is it equal additions? No. You're thinking of something we did in the other class, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. You're right. That's the property. Is it just Is it just like negative? Um,
this one. This is the property, the one we just said, right? The one that I had her join me and we stick it up on the step, right? This is the property. It says if we have two things that are equal and we add something to both of them, it won't change it. So this property, what allows me to do this is that it's the additive property of equality. And there are occasions where your book will ask you to decide what property is used in something. So that's why I'm mentioning at this point. Now, why did we pick two and one half as opposed to, say, three and one half or just one half? Why did we choose that specific number? Because it gets the x alone. Why? Because when you add two and one half plus negative two and one half, it gets zero. Okay, so when you add two and one half and you add negative two and one half together, you get zero. Why? What are those two numbers? They are rational numbers. They're the same value, but negative signs. There's a name for them. Opposites. Keep going. You guys are almost there. They're additive inverses, right? That's two slides back. Additive inverses. That's why we chose that number, is because when it adds to itself, it gives me zero. So I do, in fact, at this point now, have x on the left, and I have these two numbers on the right. Now, this is the point where I want to show you there are two ways, and you may not have known both of these ways coming into class today, but you will when you leave. There are two ways to add these two numbers together, and they are very different approaches. Okay? So there are two methods at this point to solve this. So we, we chose to do this because they are additive inverses. Okay, so let's talk about the two properties, or the two ways to do this together now. So what I'm wanting to do is I'm, at, I'm wanting to add 3 and 1 third plus 2 and 1 half. And I'm telling you I have two ways that I can do it. Does anybody remember one way you can do it? Um, making the the same. Okay, so... You want to make the one-third and the one-half denominators the same. Is that right? Okay, so if I want to do that, what would the denominators be? Six. Six. So what would I have to multiply each of them by? Five, two, okay. So in some fashion, you know what, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit differently to give myself a little more space. In some fashion, oops, that was not what I meant to do. I'm going to, this is one of the methods, I'm going to sort of group the fractions together and group the whole numbers together. This may or may not have been where you're headed, but there's two ways to do that. You're still going to get a common denominator no matter which way you do this. So if I add or group the whole numbers together, what is 3 plus 2? Fantastic. And then I can do the common denominator thing. So we can either do this as the cross multiplying and then denominator, or we can do this as recognizing, oh, I just multiply the first one by 2 over 2 and the second one by 3 over 3. Either way we do it, we're going to end up getting a 2 plus a 3 over a 6. So my final answer ends up being 5 and 5 sixths. Um, I usually call this the mixed number approach because the numbers stay mixed numbers the whole way. Some of you had a momentary freak out when I moved things away from each other. I could see it in your eyes because this is not what you remember doing from before. So, for those of you for whom that applies, what do you remember? think you mean into improper fractions? Yeah. Yes, that's the other approach. Yeah, so the other option is to do improper fractions. And there are some benefits to doing this as well. So we'll talk about the benefits versus the detriments of each option sort of in a moment here. But let's do improper fractions. So three and one third. How do I change three and one third into an improper fraction? Right, so what's that going to give me? It is. So 3 times 3 is 9, plus the 1 is 10. So I have 10 over 3. And we'll do the same thing over here. 
and I'm going to get five halves. What's our next step? Common denominators in some fashion. So I'm going to do the cross multiply and denominators that are common like this. So this is 10 times 2 is 20, plus 3 times 5 is 15, over 2 times 3, which is 6. What is 20 plus 15? And here's a good place for me to pause and to tell you that something I told you earlier, which is 100% correct, does not apply here. A moment ago I told you that unless it told you to give me the answer in a mixed number form, you could leave it as an improper fraction, right? You remember me telling you that? This problem tells you to give the answer in a mixed number form. Now, I didn't actually use words to say that, but do you know why it tells you that? It starts with everything else. It started with mixed numbers. So if the problem starts out with mixed numbers, the answer needs to be in mixed number form. We're going to match the form. 35 over 6 is not in mixed number form, so what do we have to do? Divide. We have to divide. 35 divide by 6, which gives me what? 5. 5. And then 5, 6. So this gives me 5 and 5 over 6. Improper fractions is the only thing I learned before I ended up teaching classes. Um, I am a big fan of the mixed number approach, um, but there are cases when the improper approach works really well too. So let's just talk about some sort of benefits versus drawbacks of each of the approaches. Um, in terms of actual mathematical computation, mixed numbers took fewer steps, right? There, was, there, were, less, there were fewer steps on my screen, okay? Um, it has a very nice contextual feel to it, right? If I had three and one-third pizzas and I had two and one-half pizzas, there's no reason to take my three whole pizzas and my two whole pieces and divide them into little pieces and start counting things up. And practically speaking, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? So it has that sort of feel to it. Um, the improper fraction approach also sort of a drawback is that if the numbers, well, let me say it this way, the numbers can get very large very quickly. All right. Whereas at least with the mixed number approach, the only numbers that are sort of getting large are the parts that are fractions to begin with, the one-third, the one-half, which is much less of it getting large than the numerator becoming a big number like it did. Ten and five are not big, but what if the numerator had become 215? It gets bigger quickly. Another sort of drawback um, to the improper fraction approach is twice you've had to convert something. You had to convert it into improper fractions, and then you had to convert it back into mixed numbers. So you might be saying, okay, but you said that there was some benefit to improper fractions. There is, and it usually comes in when we see subtraction, okay? So when you do subtraction, this can be kind of complicated because what if this had been 3 and 1 third minus 2 and 1 half? Well, I can do 3 minus 2 just fine, but 1 third minus 1 half, well, that's a negative number, right? And that can be kind of confusing too. So we're going to see an example of that happen a little bit later. Um, let me go through the three or four definitions that are still on this page and then we'll stop. Yeah, I think that's a good place. And then we'll stop so that you guys can do some great work. Subtraction of rational numbers. These slides look a lot like the slides for addition. If you have, um, I'm sorry, before I get into the ones that look like addition, let me talk about these two. It's the next two slides that look like the addition. The definition of subtraction says the following. If you have two fractions, A over B and C over D, and you want to subtract them, then their answer to their difference, the E over F, is the value such that when you add it to the smaller number, you get the bigger number. And I'll do it with whole numbers just because it works the same way and it's really simple to see. The reason that 5 minus 3 equals 2 is because if you were to take 3 and add the number 2 to it, you'd get back 5. And that is usually how subtraction is very, very first introduced to children in kindergarten, first grade age. Why is 5 minus 3, 2? Because 3 plus 2 is 5. It's done in sort of fact family kind of ideas. Um, theorem 6.8 or 6-8 actually talks about the fact that if you are subtracting, it's the same thing as adding a negative. That's all that says. So subtracting C over D is the same thing as adding a negative C over D. And then the last two slides that we'll stop with today talk about what 
the process is for actually subtracting fractions. So much like it is with addition of fractions, if you have two fractions you're trying to subtract, and they have the common denominator, you simply subtract the numerators. The denominator stays the same. And we can do this from a picture form too, right? If we had 5 eighths minus 3 eighths, we could actually draw the pizza. It has 5 eighths slices. We could take away 2 eighths of it, hence eating it or, you know, whatever, and we would be left with the 3 eighths left over, or with the other value left over, whatever the numbers were that I just threw out there. Okay, so we can justify this with a picture very nicely. The subtraction works the same way as well for the un unlike denominators. So if you have A over B minus the C over D, the denominators are now different, you actually can get common denominators. One way of doing that is this cross multiplication with the denominators multiplied. That's the common denominator approach, and it has this wonderful sort of smiley face picture going on that we can keep in our mind. So you have A times D minus B times C over BD. One thing to be aware of is that this order matters. I can't do, like with addition, I could do AB, I'm sorry, I could do AD plus BC or BC plus AD. It's addition, order doesn't matter, right? Subtraction, it does. So if you're working on this one and you're thinking about this approach, you do have to start with the top left-hand corner. AD comes first, matters, or the subtraction will be in the wrong order, okay? All right, we'll stop there for today.